Hey folks, well this is a favorite of mine. Now, excuse please the somewhat setting sun and the traffic noise, but this is about as close as I can get with a really good view, with any view actually, to the former home of Peter Lawford, one of the Rat Pack and former brother-in-law to John F. Kennedy and to Robert F. Kennedy and to Edward Kennedy and all the Kennedys. Uh, anyway, yeah, if I got it from the beach side, you wouldn't see nearly this much. But this is the former compound of Peter Lawford. And as I said, I could speak about Lawford for an hour straight away because I've researched it so much. Because Lawford was truly the man who kept the secrets. In fact, there is a book about him called Peter Lawford, Man Who Kept the Secrets. Not that I'm endorsing this book in any way, negatively or positively, but that was my first source of information on Peter Lawford and what an extraordinary life and cruel later years and early death in his, I believe he was 61 years old when he finally died as a result of chronic alcoholism and drug abuse and almost penniless when he died. Uh, talk about from the heights falling to almost nothingness. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's really an extraordinary story and it explains or can explain a lot about the life and death of Marilyn Monroe, the life and death of Jack Kennedy, the life and death of Bobby Kennedy. This beachfront house, and we can see Santa Monica Beach beyond, was owned by Louis B. Mayer, the head of MGM Studios in the 30s and I believe into the 40s. And Peter Lawford, as a young actor, having been born in England but come over with his parents to the United States at a young age, Peter Lawford was at this particular house at a party because he had an MGM contract along with Judy Garland and Elizabeth Taylor and so many others. And Lawford was at this house at a party and he said, one day I'm going to own this house. And sure enough, with his eventual wife, Patricia Kennedy, who became Patricia Kennedy Lawford, Peter Lawford and Pat Kennedy bought this home. And they made an arrangement. Obviously, Pat Kennedy had the millions in a trust fund from her father, from her family. They had a deal that uh, I, I'm going to have to go back and research this. One paid the mortgage. The other paid other home expenses and the needs of the children once they had children and so on and so forth. But this is where Peter and Pat Lawford lived. Bought it in the mid-50s. And, you know, at that time, Jack Kennedy was becoming a senator. Peter Lawford was now brother-in-law to a senator from the state of Massachusetts. Bobby Kennedy was an up-and-coming lawyer. He had served in the McClellan Committee in 1957. Law, uh, Jack Kennedy would uh, eventually appoint his brother, Bobby Kennedy, to be Attorney General of the United States. Couldn't have had a more powerful family to be connected to than the Kennedys in the 50s and into, of course, the very early 1960s. However, Peter Lawford was an actor who was primarily known as, um, well, his height was in the 40s, his height of popularity. He had a injury when he was a child. He was at a resort with his parents. He was running in from playing. He was trying to go into the house. He thought that the, I guess the glass door that separated the screen door, glass door, and the main door to the residence, he thought it was open. He stuck his arm through, and when he pulled it back out, he did tremendous irreversible damage to his tendon. I mean, not only was he bleeding all over the place, in fact, he passed out in the lobby of the complex where they were living, but he had, he forever had problems with his right wrist and his hand, primarily. He had to squeeze a tennis ball for years, try to get the feeling back and you notice in a lot of movies he's got that right hand in his pocket not that it was particularly deformed but it gave him 4F status in the United States Army or the United States military I should say and he was not allowed to serve so which was probably good news for him so while many actors were serving in the war Lawford was here and uh, he had less competition at MGM for movie roles so he did succeed and he did score big time in the 40s in acting roles and by the mid-50s, he was doing TV, his drinking and alcoholism. Well, let's not say alcoholism at that point, but his drinking was increasing. 
Pat Lawford's drinking was increasing. Pat worshipped Peter when she was a child. I don't know, child, but she had his poster in her room. When, obviously, later her dream came true, she married him at the beginning of the marriage. Evidently, she really still kind of worshipped the wall, <coughs> worshipped the ground that Lawford walked on. He was an idol of millions of women, extraordinarily handsome guy, and had that slight English accent and a lot of charm. Uh, but as the years went by, and really what it was, was Lawford's non-stop philandering, non-stop cheating on his wife, uh, as did his brother-in-law, Jack Kennedy, as did, to a degree, his other brother-in-law, Bobby Kennedy, as did his definitely his other brother-in-law, Ted Kennedy, uh, and the father of the Kennedys, Joseph P. Kennedy, former ambassador. So he fit right into the family in that way. And as a matter of fact, Joe Kennedy Sr. had Lawford, Peter Lawford, investigated when it was found that Lawford was going to marry Pat. So he had his finances, he had everything investigated to see if he was a communist, a left-leaning sympathizer. He was a left-leaning sympathizer, but he certainly was no communist. But when Kennedy, Joseph P. Kennedy, found the FBI reports by Hoover himself stating that Peter Lawford had uh, engaged in prostitution over and over and over again, they had lots of files that his morality was in question. Joe Kennedy said, hey, he's one of my, he's my kind of guy. And he actually felt better about the fact that he was letting an actor uh, and an English actor, of all things, marry his daughter. So the fact that the fact that Lawford was a philanderer such of himself, a playboy like himself, may actually made him feel better. So Lawford and Pat Kennedy get married, and it's a hell of an experience at first, and it makes nationwide news, the wedding. As the years go by, you know, P Pat La Peter Lawford is cheating more and more and more, and, sp and the relationship starts to go south. At the beginning of those years, this home was used by Peter and Pat Lawford to have parties. It was really a great life. I mean, even before JFK was president, they would have, Peter Lawford would have his surfing friends over all the time, and they'd be running through the living room, out those gates that you see there, and right there onto the beach, and surfing every single weekend, surfboards going in and out of the house when Lawford was in his 30s. Pat didn't particularly... Uh, engage in that, but they had great parties all the time, and it was a party house. It was a fun house. Um, a lot of drinking. That was before the age of drugs. Even marijuana wasn't consumed then, not till later in the 60s by Peter Lawford. Um, but at that time, it was good times. Now, by the time Jack Kennedy was elected president in 1960, the marriage had already gone south. Pat Lawford was so disgusted with Peter's constant cheating, that she was routinely kicking him out of the house. But, you know, they had to remain the, or retain the facade of a happy marriage, or at least a stable marriage, because they thought that, you know, in 1960-61, they were afraid of the fallout that a divorce in the family might cause to JFK, especially his chances for re-election. Now... Not only did they have parties here, but Pat Lawford wasn't always here. She was going back east a lot uh, to Hyannisport to see the Kennedy family, her family, and others. So it was a great opportunity to for Peter Lawford and his friends to have pretty wild parties here, including Marilyn Monroe. And the rumors are stated by lots of people that President Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe, Marilyn Monroe during their liaisons, had sex in this very house and the house has got a very creepy history but we'll hear about that a little later so a lot of other things happen here now let's flash forward a couple of years 1962 if you believe the story and i'll do the story again when i go back to marilyn monroe's home in over in brentwood not too far from here that jack kennedy and had jack kennedy had stopped seeing marilyn monroe and again, you know, again, folks, this is just con conjecture. It's obviously not documented. Didn't have film of it, although apparently there are wiretaps of it, but they've disappeared over the decades. But uh, the speculation is, and has been told by others, that Jack Kennedy said, under no uncertain terms can you, Marilyn Monroe, and I continue this affair. It's dangerous to his presidency. 
Uh, he stopped taking phone calls from Maryland. Bobby Kennedy, his brother, the attorney general, stepped in and tried to intercede. And then he himself started having an affair with Marilyn Monroe. Now, where it became really dangerous is that just after the time that Marilyn Monroe was fired from her last film, Something's Got to Give, June 1st, 1962, ironically, Marilyn Monroe's 36th birthday, Bobby Kennedy was also ending the affair with Marilyn Monroe, citing again, it was too dangerous. Bobby Kennedy was launching an unprecedented attack as attorney general against the mafia. Apparently, the mafia helped his brother, Jack, get elected to the presidency. Oh, yes, there have been stolen elections for quite a while, folks. And because of that, Bobby Kennedy knew that the mafia knew that he and Jack Kennedy had had affairs with Maryland and were going to exploit those affairs. So all sides, all enemies were coming down on the Kennedys um, covertly, you know, pri secretly at this point, not the media or going to the press, but they were going to blackmail them. So Bobby Kennedy cut off the relationship, the story goes, with Marilyn Monroe, and Marilyn was was furious beside herself and on friday afternoon she told people and that whole week leading up to it that she was going to hold a press conference on monday morning and expose her affairs with both kennedy brothers and expose the contents of a little red diary that she had that she kept notes in and those notes had government secrets in them now the rationale for the diary is that she would go to dinner parties, particularly here at the Lawford Mansion with Kim Novak and others. Kim Novak, an actress who she kind of had a rivalry, seemed to know more about politics and what was going on at the time. Marilyn was not that up on everything that was going on. And as the discussions with Bobby Kennedy and Lawford's Hollywood guests became, became political, Marilyn felt she wouldn't be able to contribute things. So Bobby would uh, later tell Marilyn things he definitely shouldn't have which uh, were related to as what they call pillow talk, you know, in bed. He told her about the plans to assassinate Fidel Castro, possible invasions, a possible second invasion of Cuba, and other things that were absolutely government secrets and classified information. And Marilyn threatened to expose not only the affairs, but the contents of the diary she kept the diary because she wanted to remember things. Bobby would tell her things. She would write them down and she wanted to remember them at the dinner parties so she could appear as informed as uh, in the Hollywood crowd and whoever else might have been at these functions. So that weekend, as we know, Maryland ends up dead. Now, certainly did not talk of suicide. In fact, she had got her job back for the, and was going to complete the film Something's Got to Give. She also was under contract to do another film, and the film was eventually made with Frank Sinatra. Her professional life was looking up. The only thing was her professional life was still at rock bottom, absolute rock bottom. She was sick to death of being, she called it, used by the Kennedy brothers, passed around like a piece of meat. She was furious, and when Marilyn was furious, from what her friends say, there was no stopping her. Many people believe she was going to hold this press conference uh, come Monday morning. So, when Marilyn died of a quote-unquote apparent overdose of sleeping pills, possible suicide, uh, to which there were no sleeping pills in her stomach, which was very interesting in the digestive tract, but we'll, we'll cover that another time. So the mysterious death of Marilyn Monroe happens. Now, what preceded that, according to researchers, a lot of researchers, is that Marilyn had been, excuse me, that Bobby Kennedy had been in Central California at a friend's home, a lawyer, that weekend, but that he was forced to take a helicopter down first to 20th Century Fox, where Marilyn was employed, where Bobby Kennedy had a lot of pull as attorney general, take a drive, take a ride with Peter Lawford over to Brentwood to Marilyn's house that afternoon and that supposedly, and again this is all conjecture folks, there was a terrible argument Lawford waited by the pool while Bobby said we've got to end this relationship, I'm sorry, I do care about you but 
you know, this is going to, if this ever gets out, it could destroy my brother's chances of re-election in 1964, could destroy my aspirations to be president uh, in 1968, um, and destroy the entire family. Not to mention the fact that apparently Bobby Kennedy was searching all over the house, and those who, again, conjecture, claim they've heard the the wiretaps, because Maryland's house was absolutely wiretapped from the uh, Justice Department was wiretapping her, the Mafia was wiretapping her, Republicans Party might have been wiretapping her, and the Nixon friends. Anyway, apparently from those who say they heard the wiretaps, they say that during that argument between Bobby Kennedy trying to break off, reasonably break off the affair with Marilyn Monroe, that Marilyn, he was also saying, you know, where's the diary? I've got to find the diary. It's imperative. And we don't know whatever happened to that red diary. Anyway, Apparently then, after getting nowhere with Marilyn, there was a struggle. Marilyn was put down on the bed. That's what the audio recordings said. And Bobby Kennedy and Bob and Peter Lawford made a hasty exit. Now, supposedly Bobby Kennedy took, before coming home here, Bobby Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy was driving, uh, Peter Lawford, excuse me, Peter Lawford was driving Bobby Kennedy to the airport so Bobby Kennedy could go back up north and say he was never here in Los Angeles. Now, what's very interesting to note, folks, is that Bobby Kennedy, the very night and the very day and night of Marilyn's death, Bobby Kennedy claimed, swore he never left, left the home of his friend in Central California. However, Sam Yorty, the former mayor of Los Angeles, claims had stated, and I've seen this in interviews, that he had it on very good authority from the police chief that, in fact, Bobby Kennedy was here in Los Angeles and that Peter Lawford, from a base of operations in this house, was helping Bobby Kennedy with his alibi and then, you know, sort of escape back up north, which he did by airplane. And then to say, you know, he had heard about it on the news like everybody else, knew nothing about it, had no relationship with Marilyn Monroe, and the only relationship Marilyn had with his brother was a professional one and singing Happy Birthday President and so on and so forth. So, that method, the death of Marilyn Monroe put a big damper, apparently tremendous guilt in Peter Lawford. And Pat Lawford, his wife, was friends with Marilyn Monroe. Peter was friends with Marilyn Monroe. Joe DiMaggio knew that Hollywood was involved in the cover-up and barred everyone close to them from attending the funeral. But again, that's another story. So as the years go by, 62, 63, uh, essentially Bobby, essentially Peter Lawford and Pat were separated. Pat continued to live here in the house for a while, but mostly she spent most of her time back east. And Peter was in the home alone going crazy because he'd never be alone. He would actually invite his lovers and actress friends and people over to spend the night and they wouldn't spend the night, many of them, and he'd say, stay with me while I watch TV until I fall asleep. They divorced formally after Jack Kennedy was assassinated, although they went to the, the um, Pat Lawford agreed to go to the funeral procession with Peter Lawford, but they were split up by the time. And then they figured there was no sense in hide, keeping the sham marriage going, so they divorced. And even though... But they knew Bobby Kennedy would be running for president. They still divorced. Well, P Peter Lawford stayed alone in this home. And it's a huge home, as you can tell. And he was rambling around. 